Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast. Our primary objective is to motivate and inspire our listeners to never quit. The reality of life is simple. We all fall. We all fail. At times, we get knocked down. The question is, do we get back up? Are we stronger? Are we better prepared to attain the maximum of our potential? Thank you for joining our No Quit Tribe. As you go for your greatness today, never quit. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. Welcome to episode number 273 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is resetting. Our quote of the day comes to us from Renda Biddy. Don't forget the power in resetting. On any given day, you are allowed to start over. If you feel you're going down the wrong path, reset. I had a lot of fun speaking with today's guest. I first met him while watching MTV Sports, but recently I saw a video where he discussed his Reset 7, and I knew that I had to get him on our show. He also just released his book, which I can't wait to read. I think you'll really enjoy today's episode. Dan, I'd like to welcome you to the No Quit Living podcast. Thank you so much, Chris. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. So the first question I ask everybody is, are you ready to positively impact at least one person today? I pray that I do. I try and do. That's a goal of mine. Every day that I wake up, my feet touch the ground. My my kids are tired of me yelling positivity from the other side of the house. So uh, let's do it. I hope I can achieve that today. It'll be done. So <laughs> as you know, the number one objective of our show is to both motivate and inspire listeners to never give up. And I was curious if you yourself have either a no-quit story or perhaps a really challenging time where you could have given up or given in, but you didn't. Um. You know, and thinking about that, I have, uh, when I finished college, um, I had $1,100 in my pocket and I went to the University of North Carolina and I, uh, after I graduated, moved to Los Angeles with the hopes of becoming an actor. Um, when I had to tell my parents that this was a decision I made, um, that I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, my father was my high school principal, an Italian immigrant. My mother was a, st- a seamstress and a, a teacher at a school for kids with special needs as well, so... When I told them I was moving to LA to be an actor, they said, okay, how much money do you have? $1,100, who do you know? Nobody, where are you gonna live? I don't know yet. And as any smart parent would say, they'd say, no, let's try and figure this out. My parents were even smarter and said, okay, we support you. So um, I, I moved to Los Angeles and you know, a lot of, two years later, I started working for MTV as a production assistant and then created a show for them. But in that two year window, Um, you know, looking back, my father had asked me a few years ago, he said, did you ever think about moving back when I was struggling? I mean, I literally was living in a studio apartment with a futon and a hot plate, uh, eating Kraft mac and cheese and ramen noodles every day. And it was one of those things where I just, yeah, I thought about moving back. One, I didn't have the money to move back, but two, I also had I guess it was pride and a belief in myself that I wasn't going to quit. I didn't want to say, hey, I've been out here for six months. I gave it a shot. Let's go home. Because, you know, at the age of like 21, 22, you think 30 is really old. So I remember I always thought like, I don't want to be, I don't want to wake up one day, be 30 years old and just go, what would have happened if, what would have happened if, and and I was the youngest before I had two older brothers and an older sister. And I, I was always raised thinking that if you start something, you need to finish it. You can't quit in the middle of it. So I moved out there to pursue a dream, and I made uh, an intentional effort to start thinking about things more positively and putting those positive vibes out into the universe, as silly as that sounds to some people, and just really trying to strive and achieve, and one thing led to another, and... um, basically created the foundation for the life that I live now and the career that I, I have now. So, you know, looking back at that, that was something that if I would have quit at that point in my life and just said, this is ridiculous, it's too much. And I'm going to go back and just try and help my, hope my parents help me get a job or whatever. Um, you know, my life would have been completely different. So, um, you know, looking back at it, I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm proud of myself for, for sticking it out and, and, proud of myself for somewhat being a wet behind the ears, ignorant 22 year old. That's like, I could do this. I could do this. I don't know if it was a, a good thing or bad thing, but looking back, it was a really good thing. 
No, I, th- I think it's so interesting how, how you touch on when you look at something as a 22-year-old. And I think the reality is if, if, you were in, if we were all in situations in our late 20s, 30s, or 40s, the reality is you probably would have responded differently and said, you know what, yeah. I did give it that try and I do yeah. need to get a real job. But I think the reality is you touched on something where you talked about living the life you are now. And I just wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind just quickly telling our listeners a little bit about you know, who you are and what you do right now. Uh, I started as, like I said, I was a production assistant at MTV. I then, and in LA, um, became the host for a show called MTV Sports. Uh, uh, the the way that show came about was I had handed in a treatment to people in New York. They liked it. Then I didn't hear anything about it. Then a few months later, they created this new show called MTV Sports. I was lucky enough to try out um, to host it, got the job, and within three months, I went from being a production assistant to on air talent and on their number one show worldwide. We were on in 72 countries. So when MTV Sports hit, it was kind of this extreme sports show that really was unlike anything else anybody had seen before. We shot it on film, uh, edited the mess out of it. Our editors won Emmys. Um, we unseated Wide World of Sports. They had a 11-year run as best sports show on television. Um, so I went from that, then broke into the acting uh, industry and acted in, uh, I think I've been in over 600... Uh, episodes of television. I was on a show called Veronica's Closet for uh, three years, What I Like About You for a few years, um, MTV Sports I did for seven. So, and now, um, you know, I, 10 years ago, geez, I still think it's 1997. And now with the virus, <laughs> I don't know what year it is. Uh, let's see, what year is it? 2020, uh, nine years ago, I got divorced. And once I was divorced, I was working on a show for True TV. I was hosting a show called uh, Guinness World Records Unleashed. And I did that for two seasons. What was great about that show was uh, we shot 13 episodes a year, but I we would shoot 13 episodes in 18 days. Wow. So I basically took those two years where those 18 days I'd work, and then I wanted to spend time with my kids and really help them get through the divorce and, and help myself as well and sort of create a, a new foundation for us in our lives. And uh, so I basically took some time off doing that. And uh, now I'm back. I've just written a book. Uh, I'm producing a few things on the heels, hot on the heels of um, The Last Dance. Uh, I'm producing, we're in pre-production now, for a Last Dance version of Rock and Jock uh, of the old MTV games, which I'm so excited about. People were really excited about. So it's good to, um, writing the book was such a cathartic thing for me um, because it, it, it started as something and ended somewhere completely different where I didn't expect it to end. And I'm really proud of that. So um, first and foremost, I'm proud about being a, uh, a father and a husband and uh, a friend. But, you know, it, it's good now to kind of get back into that creative aspect of things. And it helps me physically and mentally. No, it's awesome. And I appreciate you, you touching on that. And I appreciate your candor as well. So wanted to ask you an interesting question that we do ask everybody is if you had to define yourself, but you could only use one word, what word would you pick? Positive. Um, and you just, I don't know if I would have said that 10 years ago, but now, you know, sometimes you have to go through extremely difficult times to, uh, you know, there's a thing in my book where um, that we had discussed off camera, it's called the Reset Seven, and one of the things in there that I'm uh, have even added a chapter to. There's a purpose to the pain, and I realized that going through extremely difficult times, you have to live in the moment of those difficult times to experience them and really experience them, not just try and keep them away from you. Go, oh, that's terrible. I don't even want to think about that. You have to absorb it, deal with it and get past it and realize that there there was a reason that all of that happened. That is that is so so true and I, and before you go off on I wanted to ask you as you mentioned the reset yeah. 7 you and I actually connected from the positive summit with John Gordon. I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind if you could just touch on the reset 7 because I thought they were fantastic and and I took a bunch of notes during during that summit. Sure. Um the first one basically what I did was just try and create seven things that having gone through a difficult time in my life. And now with us all having to deal with the coronavirus, you know, I said it's a perfect time for us all to sort of, what I did was recalibrate and sort of, these were things that we all know and I knew, but it's like, I just needed to remind myself of, okay, here's sort of seven things that I want to re-implement into my life and 
and the way that I want to live. And and I'll make it brief. I won't make it obviously as long as it wasn't there. First one was honesty. And and that sounds easy, but it's like to live your life honestly. And it starts with yourself and you have to be honest with yourself because if you're not honest with yourself, then you're never really being 100 percent honest with anybody else. Um, the second one was I call it check yourself. So I, I find that one thing that's really worked for me is that anytime I get into any confrontation or disagreement or even if it's an argument with your wife or a coworker, or any sort of disagreement, what works best for me is to go, wait a second. Let me take a step back before I respond to anything. Find out, hey, what did I do? What part did I play in this situation? Is it potentially my fault that we're in this situation? Did I say something? Did I say do? Did I do something that maybe it was my fault? As long as you can do that and sort of check yourself and say, hey, was I responsible for this or not? Then you can move forward to find a solution. The third one after that is admit when you're wrong, which comes off of check yourself. If you did do something wrong within that uh, situation, you have to admit when you're wrong. I found that as a, uh, a father, especially, it's imperative to admit when you're wrong to your kids because it's important for your kids to hear that if you did something, hey, everybody's held responsible. And if it's starting at the head of the household saying, that's my bad, I did something wrong. That's me, I'm gonna try my best not to do it anymore. Then everybody the rest of the way down realizes there's you know, uh, uh, accountability along the way. Um, I think, it, what am I, the number four, learn from your mistakes. That's pretty pretty simple and easier said than done though. Um, you know, it's one thing to go, yeah, I made it, why'd that happen? Oh, that happened because of this. It's okay if you know why it happened, but did you learn anything from it? And, and I've always said, I've learned exponentially more from the mistakes I've made in life than I have from the successes I've had in life because you need to be present in those those times where you make those mistakes uh, and, and absorb that and learn from it. Um, that helps to lead to something called wisdom. That's not on the reset seven, but uh, next, number five, is the earmuffs. So, just you, especially in this day and age of, oh goodness, social media, you gotta just weed out the negativity. And, and there's so much negativity in the world today, so much. And it's almost like everybody on this planet is like, if you're not doing it my way, you're doing it the wrong way, as opposed to being open to listening, to being creative. And hey, let's let's figure this out together. So you've got to, I just say, don't listen, weed it out. And a lot of times the best response you could give to, to those negative people is no response at all, just none at all. Um, number six, positivity. I, I said earlier, I said, you know, my wife and kids often get tired of me. I'll hear from the other side of the house. Maybe if I feel somebody's <laughs> getting a little bit off track, I'm just yelling positivity, positivity. And they do it back to me too. That's um, awesome. So that's why when you asked what word would describe me, I said positive. And then finally, finally, number seven was purpose to the pain. Um, as long as we can sit there and realize, and, and you know what, getting through the purpose to the pain, why did it happen? But also be proud of yourself that you, you, you went through something difficult. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's not an ego driven thing. That's not you. You should be proud. Hey, I made it through this difficult time. What did I learn from it? And and I do personally, even the most difficult times I've been in my life, been through in my life. I try to find, and it's not for everybody. I try to find humor in it. I try to find humor in it, and it's, and and that stemmed from when I went through my divorce. I was in therapy at one time. I'd never gone to therapy in my life. And I started to go see this, this therapist just to like, basically just to empty out my brain. And I had seen him for a few months and I was telling a story, a horrific divorce story uh, in therapy at one time. And I just, in the middle of it, I just broke down. Did I cry? No, I started cracking up. And he looked at me and he's like, why, why are you laughing? I said, because I'm listening to the story that I'm telling. And if I didn't know that it really happened, I would think this is so ridiculous. Like if some guy is telling that to me over a beer, I'd be like, sorry, dude, but I'm, I'm sorry I'm laughing. But that's hilarious. You know, it's, it's sound, they started thinking like something you hear in a movie. And that to me was a real cathartic thing for me because to me, that was proof to me that I was starting to heal, that these things that used to hurt me now were making me laugh. So purpose to the pain, man. It's, it's a great mantra to live by. 
Well, <clears throat> I I have to tell you that I, I thought your your program on the Positive Summer with John Gordon was awesome, and uh, again, Thank you. that's how we connected. But when you when you break down your reset seven the way you did, it, it really hits home because I think so many of them really align with what we talk about and teach and coach at No Quit yeah. Living. But one of the things when, when you talked about earmuffs, I thought it was so important because. I talk about that quite often, and, and my listeners know I, I talk about it. And the, the phrase that we use, the term we use, is muting negativity by spreading positivity. And, and when you referenced that comment about social media, it, it's it's so powerful because I don't think people understand the algorithms and the way in which if you comment things, if you like yeah. certain things, if you share certain things, if you repost them, all of a sudden you start seeing more of those things. And I think what people don't right. realize is – if you don't want to see things about this or about that, then don't forward them to friends and don't just ignore them. You know, and the way you spread that positivity and the way you ignore the other things, i.e. earmuffs, is just you disregard them. And I think you said something that was really powerful. Sometimes the best response and the most powerful response is nothing. Because a lot of times people want you to respond. They want you to engage oh, yeah. with them. They, and all of a sudden that just spreads spreads more more negativity but but the last point that you said which which was so powerful i feel was the purpose to the pain and the underlying component you said is be proud of what you've gone through and and obviously you referenced your divorce and it's not about just what the what the aspect is it's it's going through it and becoming a better version of yourself on the other on the other end but follow up question that i'm curious is is how did you come about with these with these reset seven obviously you know through throughout different places and things in your life, but was there one specific thing all of a sudden when you said, you know what, I'm going to create this, this reset seven. Um, as I said earlier, it's, it's part of my book. And that w- when I started writing the book, I had no intention to put that in it or even had it in my mind at that point. Um, I, I can I give you a brief synopsis of the book? Cause it'll help me answer the question. The, I was approached by uh, Wiley Publishing to write a book. Uh, uh, the senior vice president who ran the company uh, approached me because he had seen that I just had another child. On uh, so He followed me on Instagram. And he said, why don't you write a book about uh, fame and fatherhood? Fame, but make it positive, because you're a positive guy. Make it positive, make it positive. So long story short, I said, he kept saying, this is what I want the book to be, but uh, make it a book about Dan. It's got to be a book about Dan, a book about Dan. So finally, I'd never met the guy in person. We had talked by email and a couple times on the phone. So I had asked him at one point, I go, I'm not trying to sound like a jerk. I said, but can we get on the phone? Because I have a question. You keep saying, make it more Dan, more Dan. I, I, I don't know what you mean by that. Like what exactly? We've, we, so I said, we've never met in person. Um, we've talked on the phone. but So just out of curiosity, what type of person do you think I'd be like, like to hang out with? Uh, and he said, well, I've asked around the office. And we think you'd be like the character that you played on Seinfeld. Um, and the character I played on Seinfeld was a character, was Elaine's boyfriend, who was Jerry called a male bimbo. He's a mimbo. <laughs> she was only dating him for his looks. He had nothing upstairs. So, and then he, he went on to give me all these compliments and accolades. I didn't listen to any of them because I just, all I heard was him calling me a mimbo. So I interrupted him. I said, I'll write the book. And he said, okay, why? I said, because I want to prove to people that's not, who I am. So when I wrote the outline for the book, it was going to be based in, or it's going to be three sections, my foundation, fame, and then fatherhood. And when I started writing it, I said, here's how I wanted to write the book. I look at my life like a jigsaw puzzle and take it all apart and then start piecing it back together with these random stories that I remember from my life. And when I'm done putting it back together, does it look the way that I, I thought it looked initially? Because I always said, Look, the way that I perceive myself, all of this is true for everybody. The way I perceive myself, the way we think other people perceive us, and the way other people actually do perceive us are three entirely different things. So it was important for me to know that I perceive myself the way I thought I did. And and finally getting through, because the book starts, it's an anecdotal look at my life. It's almost a comedic look at these different stories, things that have happened to me. I tell the, and I write each, each chapter is three to five pages because that's my attention span. And then I end each, each story with, this is what I learned from it and helped me move forward in life. And when I got to the, the final third of it about fatherhood, there were all these things where it went almost from an anecdotal story of my life to a spiritual 
kind of the arc of the book becomes somewhat spiritual at the end of it because of what I've learned from the big first two portions of this book till now and in being a father. And that's where the reset seven came into it because these were virtues that I wanted to had implemented into my life. But sometimes you just forget on a daily basis and you needed to be reminded. So I reminded myself by putting this in the book and I thought it would be great to also remind my kids and hey, this, you know, let's sort of follow these guidelines in life and you'll be okay. It's a good start on a daily basis if we follow these things. So sorry that was long-winded, but that's how we got to it. No, I think it, it, it's it's really important to to discuss kind of where and why I think for for our listeners out there because everybody has their own story. Everybody has certain things that they're taught and they they appreciate at different points in their life. But your book comes out Tuesday, June 16th. So if you don't mind, just tell our listeners a little bit about where they can find it and uh, the best way for them to connect with you also. Sure. The uh, The book is called Step Off, uh, My Journey from Mimbo to Manhood. <laughs> uh, obviously, from the reason I just told you, Step Off was the catchphrase of my character in the episode of Seinfeld I did. Uh, you can pre-order it or actually just get it on Amazon. Uh, Barnes and Noble, Noble.com, anywhere you can find books. It'll be in bookstores. Also, uh, I have the T H E, Dan Cortez, D A N C O R T E S E dot com. Uh, you can even message me on there. You can order it from there. Message me. We're also sending out autograph bookmarks, things like that. Going to do uh, Zoom Q and A's with people who purchased the book. Uh, and I told you earlier, off camera, the reason. Uh, we did the Dan Cortez was because they wanted 25 grand for dancortez.com. So I thought the Dan Cortez for $1.99 sounds a lot better. Um, but yeah, it'll be everywhere. And I'm really excited about it uh, because I, anytime I promote the book, um, I always do the hashtag. It's not what you think, because I, I believe that I feel people have a certain perception of me that know me from what I've done for a living from television to film. And I think the book may surprise quite a few people. Yeah, and, and but I think, you know, it, it's it's cool that you just touched on that. I think that happens a lot of times in life when you see somebody in a specific arena. And we do a lot with Broadway Entertainment uh, as my family investors and producers and things. And you see people in different, I guess, roles or different settings. And all of a sudden, you connect them in a different way. And you're like, oh, wow, that was pretty interesting. So I definitely, I think that's so true in, in so many different phases of life. So interesting question we ask everybody is if you could have dinner with anybody dead or alive who would you pick you know i always hear that question go oh man like who would you pick? and i never come up with my own answer <laughs> dead or alive who would i pick can i pick two people you could pick two because there are a couple there are a couple my uh i was the youngest of four my father was the youngest of seven um when i was born my father's parents had both passed away so my two older brothers and older sister had both met them and would always speak fondly of them. Uh, and I never got a chance to meet them. So uh, for me, I would, that would be the ultimate dinner. Obviously, I love to cook, and I think I'm a pretty good cook. But from what I've heard about my grandmother, you know, an Italian lady, you know, lived her life in Italy. I'd let her cook and um, have some of my grandfather's homemade wine with him and, and enjoy that meal immensely. That'd be awesome. Yeah, and I would definitely leave the cooking to her. She's probably uh, yeah. got you just a little bit on that. <laughs> I think just a lot of it, yeah. So if you could go back to the 20-year-old version of yourself and give yourself just one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, okay. If, if I had – okay, if I had to, I would preface it with this. I wouldn't. Um, That's awesome. Because I would just say, you know, you, you got to learn – you know, just get out there and do it yourself and figure it out. Um, but if I could give myself some advice, something I learned to do later in my 20s and then as I have gone through life, live in the moment and really absorb everything that's happening. And I always say that it's much easier for people to go, yeah, yeah, I live in the moment. Of course you do. Everybody lives in the moment when things are amazing. And you really absorb that and it's awesome. But the most important thing is live in the moment when things are really bad. And you need to absorb and, and look at those times as well um, and realize why those things happen. And if you could do that in the moment as opposed to a few years later and go, oh, I get why that happened. Yeah, I wish that wouldn't. And now I know better. Live in the moment and absorb all those times. I always There's something I read about in the book that um, – 
I tell the story that not a whole lot of people know about, but um, I, 1995, uh, I was in Honolulu, Hawaii for opening a Planet Hollywood. So when Planet Hollywood was at a tight, and uh, the night before the opening, they had pre-parties and they'd have all the celebrities there and this and that. And they had this huge escalator and the bathrooms were downstairs. And I was the night before running down the steps, I had flip-flops or the escalator flip-flops on, go to the restroom, trip and fall, land on my face, mm. get rushed to the emergency room, ended up having to have over 100 stitches in my face and out inside and outside of my nose. My nostril was detached, all these wonderful things. But the prior to... They cleaned me up, and prior to the surgery starting, I still hadn't had a chance to go to the restroom. So this is about an hour and a half later. So I asked him, I said, please, I just need to, to go to the restroom. So there was a restroom off of the operating room we're in, and they just said, okay, go right there real quick. Standing in this restroom in the Honolulu, Hawaii uh, hospital, looking at myself in the mirror, for, for, didn't even look like me. And that was sort of when I realized like, I needed to – absorb that moment. I didn't go, oh my God, go to the bathroom, get back out there. I looked at myself and it was probably the first time in my life where it's like, I need to absorb these times too, as well as the good times. So um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. I don't know. No, I, that, I think that's, that's really a, a, a very interesting perspective, how, how you touched on it. But I think it's something that in, with social media and technology, I think it's even more important today is, is living in the moment. You know, so many people live quote unquote in the moment with their head down in a phone yeah. just so I think that's awesome so we're going to change lanes now to what we call okay. our, our hot seat questions uh -oh. and the only thing we ask of you is you just spit out the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> oh oh okay get the <laughs> get the beep, get the bleep button ready okay Let's if you go. had if you had one last meal and you could absolutely pick anything what would you pick oh my mother's spaghetti and meatballs or my mother's stuffed shells. Yeah. That How about half half and half? Half and half. Let's do it. And then she can make me a, a homemade cherry cheesecake for dessert. I'm good to go. Favorite smell? Oh, my kids. My one-year-old baby. Yeah, wow. I was about to say, I, I got 11, 9, and 7. Uh, one years old is definitely the, the 9 and 11 is not my favorite smell right now. <laughs> All-time favorite sport? Football. Pittsburgh Steelers fan, grew up in Pittsburgh, so yeah, football. I, I My dad was a basketball coach growing up uh, before he became my high school principal, but yeah, football for sure. So now I think you answered the next question, all-time favorite team? Steelers. You know, people always ask me, are you a diehard Steelers fan? And I'm like, there's really no other kind. Like, you don't see a guy that goes, I kind of like the Steelers. It's like a Patriot fan. I kind of like them. Nobody yeah. says that. <laughs> I kind of like the Steelers when it's Sunday in the fall. And yeah, winter. exactly. <laughs> all-time favorite movie? Oh, okay. I just had this discussion yesterday with my 19 year old son because it was on Shawshank Redemption, but that can change if Braveheart is on. So it's, it's neck and neck between Braveheart and Shawshank. A Braveheart, Braveheart to me, just, just edges it out just a little bit. I had in Braveheart, we shot an episode of MTV sports with Mel Gibson from the set of Braveheart. I was all made up. I was all made up in the the garb like they had me ready to be the 13th century you know scotsman he came out for the segment we had him on the show he beat the living crap out of me with a wooden axe that had a blood pack on the end of it and then as soon as we finish the segment he's like you want to be in the movie i was like sure of course so we go he's going to put me in a scene where he the scene where he's getting knighted and then there's all these extras in the background i was so far in the background that i figured the camera's not even going to see me so we're rehearsing the scene they do the rehearsal I have my MTV camera off to the right. So I'm dancing, making faces at them because we're shooting at the same time. So Mel finishes rehearsal for the scene and says to the DP, the cameraman says, how did it look? He goes, look, it looked great. But the asshole in the back was dancing the whole time. <laughs> and so Mel turns around and I was like, should I? And he's like, yeah, just so that was my, my chance at extra history to be in Braveheart. But yeah, I had to be. Doing the cabbage patch in the back of a scene of Braveheart. Just the people that are listening to this show, uh, our secret. We'll, we'll tell them that you're in it. It's okay. Okay, there you go. Even better. Favorite quote? <sighs> wow. Favorite quote? Uh, there's a lot. Um, I, I don't know if I have a favorite quote of um, anybody else's, but I, I always say, I like to say myself, don't mistake my ignorance 
for stupidity and don't mistake my kindness for weakness. Um, so I don't know if I, I, I don't really have, there's, so, I have like a book of quotes that I love so many, it, you know, it's different on a daily basis for me. No, it's, it's so funny you say that because that same thing with me, I've, I've collected quotes and I think at one point I was, I was subscribed to like five or six different quotes of the day emails. So I, I have a list of, of thousands, all, all time favorite book. Uh, I, this is going to sound silly, and I don't know why, but I've always said this: Dante's Inferno. Okay. I, it was something that when I read, I read it the first time in college. I had to read it for a course in college, and it really uh, affected me and and how how I looked at things. So yeah, I'll go with Dante's Inferno for sure. Seven levels of hell. I, I didn't think that was coming, but that that that's interesting. <laughs> Favorite musician, group, or band? Woo. Um, that's not because I like so many genres of music. I'd say U2 and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Wow. Okay. I I don't know if uh, if I would have guessed that one either. <laughs> what would you have thought I would have said? I. You know what? I was gonna say, you know, something a little bit more hip hoppy. I would say just from the MTV world. Rap. My rap group is Public Enemy. Yes, Public Enemy. I liked. One. I liked when rap groups had something to say. Something to. In their lyrics, they had something to say. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And then if you were stuck in a foxhole and you could only have pick one person to have your back, who would it be? <sighs> my dad, for sure. He's always had my back. Awesome. And then the last question I have for you is if you have any parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners today. Um, you know, I, I said it at the end of the thing that I did for the Reset 7. Uh, be kind to people because there's not enough kindness today and if you love somebody tell them life's too short I love it I think great advice and especially as this episode releases during this um, pandemic that we're going through so I truly truly appreciate it for our listeners again next Tuesday the 16th of June the book comes out but definitely connect with Dan on social media and I truly appreciate what you shared I absolutely love those reset seven I hope that you and I can connect again soon Looking forward to it, Chris. Thanks so much for the time, bud. Thank you for listening to episode number 273. In addition to being a really great guy, Dan is also extremely positive. I absolutely love his Reset 7, and I think that there are so many takeaways for each and every one of us. In his parting words, Dan shared the importance of being kind to people, and if you love someone, tell them, because life is way too short. So as we have had a very difficult and extremely challenging 2020 from March up until now, I will copy Dan's words. We should all be kinder to others. And if there are people in our lives that we love, tell them. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time. And we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.